Puts. Looks like we have a nice crowd. Thank you for coming tonight. We're very excited to host um, author and naturalist Bernd Heinrich. He joins us tonight to celebrate the launch of his book of collected essays, A Naturalist at Large. As the New York Times book review notes, these passionate observations superbly mix memoir and science. Um, as I was reading, these essays span a number of years and a number of ecosystems, starting with observations of Earth, of its foundation of soil and rocks, then moving on to insects, mammals, ravens and other birds, and ending on strategies for life. One of my favorite essays is O. Tenenbaum, where Bernd talks about the natural growth of the coniferous trees, the spruce and balsam fir, so popular for Christmas, and raises important questions about altering its true shape to feed a human expectation of what a live tree should look like in our living rooms. <laughs> if our ignorance of how conifers grow can allow us to do this to a Christmas tree, how much more might we alter nature at large without caring or even knowing, he says. Of course, to understand what is at stake, you should read the book. <laughs> so you can pick up your copy here tonight at Bear Pond Books, and for those watching on Orca Media, you can come into the store anytime. I'd like to remind everybody to please mute or turn off your cell phones, and to let you know that the front door is locked for the duration of the reading. The back door is open if you need to exit during the reading. There is a bathroom at the back of the store to the right of the back door, um, and please help yourself to refreshments at the back table. I'd like to thank the Vermont Arts Council for featuring this event as a Vermont Arts 2018 program. There are complimentary Vermont Arts stickers at the counter if you'd like to pick one up. I'd also like to thank Orca Media for filming tonight's event. If you're interested in seeing this video, or if you're interested, bless you, in learning about other um, Bear Pond Books events, I'm going to pass around our um, sign-up sheet for our newsletter. All, all our, our event videos will be in the newsletter, plus upcoming events such as uh, Reeve Lindbergh. She's the daughter of aviator Charles Lindbergh. She'll be here on Tuesday, um, May 15th, talking about her new memoir called Two Lives, which is a, um, a neat collection of essays that reconciles the seemingly separate worlds of fame and privacy. But tonight we are proud to present Bernd Heinrich, a professor emeritus in the biology department um, at the University of Vermont, and the author of numerous books about nature writing and biology, including best-selling Winter World, Mind of the Raven, Why We Run, The Homing Instinct, and One Wild Bird at a Time. Among his many honors is the 2013 Penn New England Award in nonfiction for Life Everlasting. He resides in Maine, and we're thrilled to have him here at Bear Pond Books. Everyone, please welcome Bernd Heinrich. Thank uh, Bear Pond Books for inviting me, and uh, thank you for, for coming. So this is the first uh, outing of, of this new book. Uh, it just came off the press about a week ago, I think it was. And, uh, and so in a way, it, it's also an, an outing for me as, as a naturalist. I mean, the, the, the title says this, and naturalist at large. So. It, so it's, it's about me. And, uh, you know, it wasn't always cool to, to be a naturalist. I always thought of myself, you know, I'm, I'm a scientist. I'm not a naturalist. And that was kind of imbued in me <clears throat> already when I was um, applying for graduate school. And I remember uh, <clears throat> interviewing at the University of New York at Buffalo uh, <clears throat> to go to uh, graduate school. And, uh, you know, I was passed around to the various professors and interviewed, and uh, they would kind of uh, check you out, you know, if you're suitable material. And, you know, one of them kind of surprises, hey, you're a naturalist, and showed me the door, you know. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so, it's, so at, at this point, um, <clears throat> Uh, I, I guess I, I am a naturalist, and I think I was one uh, since I was six years old. Uh, but uh, 
Uh, but I didn't realize that there were certain connotations attached to it, etc. So I want to today talk a little bit about uh, about uh, kind of the journey uh, because uh, these uh, essays in in uh, the about thirty five essays in this book uh, were written over the last uh, thirty years and. Uh, Actually, I've been <clears throat> uh, publishing uh, science since uh, almost twice as long. And so, so this uh, came more recently. And, uh, <clears throat> and <clears throat> so first of all, I want to say, you know, I, 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 I really like the cover of this book. You know, that's how you judge a book. Uh, <laughs> and. Uh, and you just got this beautiful art there. It's all mine. So they <laughs> made a very good choice uh, to, to, uh, to put all the good stuff in there. And uh, so this is from about eight pictures that all relate to uh, <clears throat> biology. They all relate to natural history. And they all relate to, to science. And uh, <clears throat> But I should probably <clears throat> go by the blurbs, so I'm going to read some of the blurbs in the back. Uh, so that's that's part of 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 reading the book by the cover. Uh, <clears throat> but the blurbs are actually from from different books. Uh, <clears throat> however, <clears throat> I think that's that's fitting because this book uh, includes things that went into different books because it's very different very many different topics, uh, obviously from uh, 35 uh, <clears throat> essays. Uh, <clears throat> they include topics that went into other books. So this is kind of a, a combination, really, of, of <clears throat> many books together. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, here's a, the first one in the back. It says, praise for one wild bird at a time. So there's, there's uh, <clears throat> the essays here about birds, you know, a whole bunch of them, actually. So that relates to that, uh, that book. And it says, uh, <clears throat> Bernd Heinrich is a dedicated watcher, happy to knock down the fourth wall of zoology. Well, uh, I, I never actually uh, considered knocking down any walls, <laughs> so I don't know what this is all about. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, and, and I don't even know what the fourth wall of zoology is. Uh, so, uh, so th there's maybe more behind this th than I know. And the second one is praise for the homing instinct. <clears throat> uh, it says deep and insightful writing. Well, uh, that uh, it, I never thought about deep and insightful writing, it seemed to me it's just common sense, you know? Uh, <clears throat> and, but common sense comes from, from, uh, <clears throat> from needing, from having facts, and just going by the facts, and, uh, <clears throat> and you get the facts from observations. And that's one thing, you know, that I do, is I make observations, and, uh, and then if somebody else doesn't make the observations, well, then you get insightful, you know, and <laughs> <laughs> when you write it. Uh, so that's the way it goes. Uh, okay, here's praise for life everlasting. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, it's about uh, life everlasting is, f is far from morbid. Instead, it's life affirming, uh, convincing the reader that physical demise is not the end of life, but an opportunity for renewal. Okay, well, a little bit actually of that I have, I saved that just to the very end of, of this book, one short piece. So that's a good ending, right, about death. But it's really about renewal. Death really is about renewal. It's, uh, <clears throat> it's a continual renewal in nature. You can't have it without death, and you can't have it without birth. So it's all part of the process. And uh, I didn't do it intentionally, but... Uh, that topic comes up at the very last, but in terms of ecological conservation. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, so here's a nice one. It says, uh, <clears throat> uh, Heinrich uh, richly deserves 
the comparison to Thoreau. Well, you know, I kind of puzzled on this one. I mean, uh, <clears throat> Henry David Thoreau uh, was a philosopher, and, and I think they would label him as a transcendentalist. I'm not exactly sure what a transcendentalist is, but I don't consider myself transcending uh, anything, and I don't know what it is. Uh, <clears throat> but I think he. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, so, so, so what am I uh, uh, that I get compared to Thoreau? I mean, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a runner, I'm a scientist, I'm an artist, a physiologist, an ornithologist, an entomologist, uh, ethologist. So I, I didn't know about Thoreau being any of those. So I don't know how the, how the comparison holds. Uh, <clears throat> however, all of these things are, uh, except maybe being a runner, uh, concern uh, <clears throat> being a naturalist. Because a naturalist combines just about you know, all the disciplines, uh, <clears throat> and um, uh, it brings them together. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, maybe trans transcendentalist means to bring a lot of things together. And uh, that is, comes only from, <clears throat> from a broader contact, uh, from, from broad interest. And it said uh, that I'm a passionate ob uh, observer uh, and I mix memoir and science. Well, uh, I never thought of it as a, <clears throat> uh, well, the passionate comes from really from be, from be, just being interested <clears throat> and and finding something interested, and uh, <clears throat> and and that comes from just being out and observing and and asking questions, and uh, <clears throat> and <clears throat> memoir it comes kind of automatically because it, it being means being involved in the process. Uh, as an observer, and uh, rather than being global and uh, <clears throat> speaking in terms of generalities, uh, it, it, observations very often become kind of personal, uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, from experience. So. Uh, <clears throat> So I see as being a naturalist comes from original observations in the field from a personal perspective and putting your own spin on it and putting it in the context of what is known and trying to find out more about it. And, uh, and as I said, you know, I've, I've been that uh, since I was a uh, very uh, small child, and and I remember <clears throat> how um, uh, during my PhD uh, <clears throat> qualifying examinations, for example, at UCLA, uh, professor asked me, he says, "Why did you decide to be a biologist?" And you know, I couldn't I couldn't think of any answer of why, and. Uh, then I said, then I remembered a kind of an experience that I had uh, that, that left uh, a memory uh, that is, you know, as sharp right now, you know, as it was 72 years ago. And <clears throat> it was, you know, I was going across the brook, and it was in the spring about this time, and the willows were in bloom, and <clears throat> there were bumblebees uh, flying. Uh, from <clears throat> uh, one flower to the next and humming, and there were birds there, uh, warblers, uh, hawking insects, and I remember that scene exactly. So, so that uh, sort of left a, uh, an impression of, of something uh, really wonderful and, and fascinating, and that would focus interest uh, uh, for forever, basically, 
and in finding new thrills like that. And uh, so, <clears throat> but it, it led to, to, doing, to doing studies and finding, later on it went to uh, trying to find out uh, what was really going on. It's basically, you know, this is life and this is the most important thing on earth and, uh, and uh, what is behind it, and what makes it fascinating, uh, what makes it tick. And uh, so it's strange that during my PhD qualifying, I talked about, you know, this, this vision I had about these bumblebees. And they, they kind of looked at me like I was a little bit crazy. Uh, and I forgot about bumblebees for my PhD. I didn't work with bumblebees. I worked with moths, actually. Uh, but later on, I did work with bumblebees. And a matter of fact, I, I did some of my best, uh, uh, most scientific work with, with bumblebees. I had like four or five publications in, in the premier science journals in science and in nature. Uh, it happened to be about bumblebees. I don't know. It just happened. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so, <clears throat> so that led to... Uh, 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 trying to, to put it together and, and trying to uh, uh, communicate it. And uh, <clears throat> I remember uh, another professor at, at Berkeley there, uh, I've been working with bumblebees uh, going back to Maine every summer, and uh, I'd go out in the field and, and chase bumblebees around uh, for one reason or another and end up with a paper in science about Nobody really cared, and I didn't, you know, communicate too much to the professors there. Uh, but he says, "Well, he says, what do you do? Don't, did you go out to Maine again and find out that bumblebees bees make honey?" <laughs> and so I said, "Well, I, I better communicate that there's more going on than making honey." And so I wrote bumblebee economics, and that kind of led to one thing uh, after another. And, uh, and, uh, and again, the idea was uh, to bring it, uh, the topics into a larger context. Uh, and so writing actually for me was, was also uh, a, a path of discovery because once I started to write, I found out what I really didn't know at all uh, and, and try to put it together. Where are the connections? And uh, so whenever I was writing, I would, uh, for <clears throat> a general audience, I would find out interesting problems that I hadn't solved, and, and that, that just popped out. And, uh, <clears throat> and one thing led to another. And uh, I don't know how much time we have, but I do want to leave uh, quite a lot of time for, for your questions. Uh, and uh, so... <clears throat> Uh, we heard what the general uh, topics were. Uh, <clears throat> it went from, from, from things from the earth, uh, uh, plants, uh, to, uh, to insects, and that is, of course, natural connection when you're talking about bees, you're talking about flowers, etc. Uh, <clears throat> and when you're talking about bees, you're talking about community uh, action. And that actually led to ravens because, you know, bees share information and there were ravens doing something that looked similar, but it turned out to be very, very different. Um, but, uh, but you get insights from one to the other. So, you know, at this point, I'd, I'd like to uh, uh, be open to, to, to your questions and, and, and uh, <clears throat> discuss some of these things uh, if you have questions. And, of course, i got to leave... Time for signing books too, right? Yes. What kinds of things are you working on this week in Maine? Uh, tree swallows. Yeah, I for the last uh, <clears throat> seven or eight years, uh, <clears throat> I've uh, uh, watched uh, tree swallows, uh, and and I've noticed uh, that that the males bring white feathers into the nest. Uh, and, and, uh, and not just any white feathers, but long ones, usually those curved ones, those of the secondaries of the wings are their favorites. So I made tests 
uh, put out, spread out feathers. Actually, I had, uh, I was watching them so much that they were paying no attention to me. I could hold up a feather and they'd kind of take it out of my hand. <laughs> uh, and uh, so anyway, I did tests and, and find out, you know, what they really prefer. And then I'm trying to find out, you know, why. And so actually I have a draft of a book of, of that written right now. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, but by writing it, I write it earlier so that I can, I find all the things that I don't know. And, and now, you know, I have to clean up and, uh, and get more observations to fill them in. So why did you pick tree swallows? What, I mean, what, how, why do you pick a copy? Yeah, well, I, I just like birds, and uh, so I've always put out bird houses ever since I was a kid. I think I was eight years old when I made bird boxes, hammered together out of boards, barn boards, and hung them up. And, and there would be tree swallows and bluebirds and kestrels and starlings. Uh, and, uh, uh, it, you know, they were just for the fun of it. But, uh, and so I, I still put up bird boxes all the time and uh, you know in one bird at a time you may have read you know how sometimes I don't even have to put a bird box up uh, Flicker came and knocked the holes through the wall and uh, built a nest right there uh, but uh, yeah tree swallows were right next door and <clears throat> So one, the reason was because they're right under my nose, just like bumblebees, you can watch them from two feet away. And here with these tree swallows, they were five feet away. So, you know, you take what's, what's available and what can be most easily uh, seen and observed. Uh, and then once you start watching, you see interesting things that, that you, you just can't imagine. And uh, I couldn't imagine, you know, I knew pretty much, you know, what, what the other birds were doing, I know the chickadees in the box there, they didn't have a single feather in there. They didn't need to line their uh, nest with feathers. And the, and the great crested flycatcher had a nest in that box and had it all lined with pine needles. And here the swallow had to have white feathers, white feathers. Starling would take feathers, almost anything, but put them in at random. And then I found out that the swallow was putting in the eggs, uh, the uh, lining, even uh, after uh, laying the eggs, which is weird because you usually should put it in before. So a lot of things just m didn't make any sense. So, so a follow-up, if I may. Uh, you said you took what was easy. Uh, how do you explain then your your fascination with ravens and hauling dead carcasses through the winter? Yeah, that's uh, is that is that is that your definition of easy? Yeah, no, that was not easy. It's a good point. It's probably the hardest thing I ever did. Uh, but uh, but the thing was, it was so fascinating because I didn't think it was going to get that hard because all I was going to do was get up one carcass. Uh, calf carcass, I've got one there, and put it out, and, uh, and see <clears throat> uh, who came, and, and they, they made a noise, and I would play back, I'd record the calls and play it back and see if the raven would come, and uh, then uh, one little thing led to another. If I had known beforehand what was all involved, I would never have done it. But <laughs> it was always here. All I have to do is take one more little step, and then I'll get a little bit closer, and then I'll be done. And I get there, well, you have to take one another one, and that's how it went. And, and be, because it was always fascinating uh, to, to take the next step. Yes? Um, they seem to be collecting mud around where my driveway is, and then they would come and like land on my feet and drink the sweat I imagine uh -huh. off of my feet. But solitary bees makes me think that they don't have a queen, or that they don't that they be solitary. But there were well, the solitary bees, uh, <clears throat> the so bees evolved to be social uh, f 
from solitary to solitary bee, let's say some of them make a little mud thing, like a little uh, pot almost. Others, you know, uh, use a hole uh, uh, like the leaf cutter, and, and then others in the ground. There's so many yeah, solitary. But anyway, basically they're all females. It's it's a single female that that does that. But when the bee started making those holes in the ground for uh, sometimes another female might come and, uh, and, and use the same hole or some of her babies uh, hatch out and make a side, a side hole and pretty soon you get more and more. And the same way as, you know, cockroaches uh, became uh, <clears throat> termites by eating in the wood, they all got all the food there and all the babies there. So you end up with just one female doing all the reproduction and, and all of the uh, offspring being neutered. Uh, uh, and uh, so in a big honeybee colony, it's still one female. letters you got and what kind of correspondences you got and maybe a pretty uh, surprising letter from somewhere in the world that you hadn't expected? No, I do not remember. I mean, I, I well, actually, I get all kinds of correspondence, uh, but, uh, but not so much with respect to um, solving the problem because they are not involved in it, uh, but I got, uh, but since you mentioned that, uh, I did get uh, uh, one letter, uh, uh, mostly I get letters from, you know, I have a pet raven, da da da, I have a pet raven, and, and after a while I pay no attention to it anymore, because I get too many, you know, I, I heard about this pet raven again and again and again. But anyway, this time I got this uh, <clears throat> letter from uh, a lady in uh, Berlin, and uh, she said, oh, we're talking about her raven, her pet raven, and, uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and by the way, she says, I work in, uh, in, uh, in a library, I think it was, uh, some kind of a division for deciphering uh, handwriting. You know, the Germans write so funny, you can't read the handwriting, you can't read the print. And, and I had a whole pile of letters from a friend of my father <clears throat> found in the attic, and I couldn't read them, I, I couldn't make them out. And so uh, I, uh, I sent her, can you translate this? And I said, oh yeah, she can do it. And then I found a whole big trove of, of letters because of my ravens, uh, that made me able to write The Snoring Bird because I got all this information which otherwise I wouldn't have got. <laughs> so a lot of times it's the unexpected things that, that come up. Uh, mostly that, uh, that is just by rummaging around. So uh, the same with, with doing the research. Uh, you do the unexpected things and unexpected things come up and it's usually those are usually surprises, and the surprises are the most fun. <clears throat> but definitely, it's a matter of, of, of contact, uh, not just through letters, but, but actually doing things. You know, here was me rummaging in the attic, for example, that led from one thing leads to another. Yes? Have you been following the changes in birds and insects and other animals in response to climate change? Uh, well, I definitely have noticed uh, a lot of changes, you know. I don't know uh, what to attribute them to. For example, I was just telling to Rick Drutches, we were talking about bees, and <clears throat> I was thinking when I was doing the studies of, with bumblebees in the 1970s, uh, I'd see a spirea bush and we just covered with 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 bumblebees all over the place and I have pictures of a dozen or so and, and last summer I went you know jogging around the, uh, the roads and spirea all over the place and I'd see one or two and, and nothing more. I said what the hell is going on? Uh, 
And it's a good thing I did the studies then because there's no way it could be done now. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, so uh, I can't imagine that there was a sudden climate change like that, that, that it would, I, I wouldn't attribute that to climate change. I mean, it could be to spread of disease or uh, uh, anything else. I mean, but you do see changes all the time. And in part, that's natural in, in, in ecosystems. I mean, I remember in Heinsberg, around the beaver bog, there was a, uh, a viburnum. I forgot which one it was now. In one year, a couple of years, it was all eaten off. There wasn't... You know, I thought it was all dead. You know, all all the leaves were all eaten, it and it was dying, and I thought it was gone. Well, too bad. You know, there was a little little beetle, but you know, two or three years later, no more beetles. They're all gone, uh, and and it's all back. So you know, things change so so quickly. There, you know, there are epidemics, uh, and there are uh, violent changes in weather. Uh, you know, you can have one big storm uh, and maybe knock at the right time, you can knock out, you know, half the bird population of some species. So, uh, and, and there is violent weather at, at uh, any age. So, you know, the whole pattern is, is not something I'm conversant on. All I can tell you is that there are big changes uh, all the time. Yes? Um, I have a question on a little bit different topic, but a lot of times when science is mentioned, math is usually the next kind of topic that's brought up. How important do you think it is to approach science from a writing and an artistic perspective? How important is it to... To write about scientific content, uh -huh. but not necessarily... In not like necessarily here, okay yeah articles and how right how yeah well that? I mean I've I am uh, a terrible dunce at math uh, <laughs> and if I had to do statistics I used to be able to do some primitive statistics and I can't do it anymore I let somebody else do it for me you know but but I don't do too much of it I don't think uh, you know 95% of my science is not mathematical. Mm. Uh, it's not... Um, uh, it, it's more related to, to, to a phenomenon that, that you can... Uh, well, you have to do... You know, I do experiments, uh, but, uh, <clears throat> but I don't have to do a thousand times, don't have to repeat it a thousand times uh, to, to, uh, to get a statistical significance. Uh, if, it, if, 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 if there's that much variation, then I figure there, there is, I'm not going to be that interested in it because there's so much else going on. I want things that, that are much clearer. Uh, and, and sometimes, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's required, uh, but I'm more interested in the phenomenon as such. I mean, for example, I was, I remember going into the, when I was interviewing there at Buffalo in, in New York, uh, uh, the professor there, they were very much into math, and, and I was total dunce at math. Uh, and uh, anyway, they had an <coughs> aquarium, and uh, it had uh, mice in there, and this was full of water, and the mice were swimming around in the water and, and breathing the water. Uh, and, uh, uh, the, and, you know, the reason I could see they were doing it, they had it, you know, under pressure, and they were pumping in oxygen into the water, so the oxygen uh, in the water was uh, totally saturated, uh, and uh, so the, they... Uh, <clears throat> the mice could, could breathe in the water and they get enough oxygen out of it. But, you know, they were interested in, you know, the, uh, uh, the precise diffusion gradients 
in terms of diffusing gradients and, and, and exactly how fast was it going in from what concentration to what concentration. Well, I could see what was going. I knew what the phenomenon was. Uh, and as far as I was concerned, I didn't give a shit about, <laughs> you know, uh, what the concentration gradient was. I know it had to be high. And whether it was uh, this percent or that percent didn't make any difference to me. But, you know, a lot of people in some problems, it does make a difference. But, you know, uh, I, th I think it's, uh, you don't need to, uh, if it comes to that, get somebody who's good at math and let them do it. No, I just work in schools and I think it's super important for people who are interested in art and science to feel like they belong to the scientific community. Yes. And that's why yeah. I love yeah. reading these kinds of books. Yeah, so... There are niches, all kinds of niches. In uh, there's there's room for artists. There's room for mathematicians, uh, general observations, uh, generalists, specialists. People come to science out of love for phenomena, and often out yeah. of love for music, out of love for a shade. They do. Yeah. Yes. 30 or 40 years ago, when you were first starting to be a naturalist, who did you find worth reading? And now, who would you say is inspiring to you? Uh, who? Uh, well, I... I, uh, I mean, I really like uh, Sigurd Olsen uh, um, uh, talking about, you know, the North Country in Minnesota, uh, and uh, I like, you know, outdoor things, um, and uh, I don't, th there are so many good nature writers now that, you know, I'm not going to be picking out many. I mean, uh, I like E.B. White, uh, he writes for general audiences, and uh, I don't know, that I, uh, I try to do, to do more watching than reading. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm reading uh, Pollen now about plants. Uh, he, he's got, uh, and uh, at the moment, and so uh, th there are lots out there. <laughs> Yes? I'm wondering how you gain the trust of a bird. We have um, a garage uh, and a, an entrance to our basement, which is what we use to go in and out of the house. And there is an old Christmas tree where a little sparrow has built a nest. And we've been watching the eggs and watching them hatch. Mm -hmm. And now uh, we've got little fuzzy babies in there. Um, and I would love to know how to keep the bird from spooking every time we come in and out. Mm -hmm. I've been testing a theory that maybe if I don't make eye contact with her, she'll stay. <laughs> but I wondered if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, I think eye contact is important. I mean, th that might spook them out, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> I was deliberate about that with my swallows. As I said, I could feed them out of my hand. Uh, and when they first came to... Um, and the first time in the clearing and went to check out the box, I would deliberately uh, go near and and act like a post, you know, <laughs> and uh, so so that they would get used to me, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, and eventually I said I'm going to see if I can get close enough to touch it on the tail, and it, you know, I got a post there, and, and I, you know, one day I'd go, another day a little bit closer, and after a while it wouldn't pay any attention to me and, and I actually touched it on the tail. And, uh, uh, so uh, with, with the ravens, for example, you, you don't get near them. Uh, and, but I found out <clears throat> that the ones that we captured and put in a big aviary, and I would be in there for hours and hours every day, uh, you know, after a while, they couldn't escape uh, so they were forced to be near me, and, and they had a chance to see that I was harmless. And after a while, they, they would feed right by my feet, wild ravens. Uh, so it's a matter of uh, 
habituation. So, uh, <clears throat> and, and, and not really scaring at them, just, uh, you know, because eye contact is very important. They, they're keyed in, a predator focuses in on them. And, and, and so the, they, they will definitely notice if you, if you really keep looking at them. Just don't pay them any attention. But be consistently near, and, you, and they'll uh, <clears throat> uh, be habituated. Yes? So in, the, in your book, The Raven in the Winter, you, you, uh, you saw a, a raven on a moose carcass, and it called out, and that was the big question, why did it call out? Right. And, and you kind of get by the end. You figured well that it was it had to it was a young raven or something, and that maybe it, it was calling out to prove that it, it could find it could find meat. Well, that was one of the hypotheses. Actually, when I wrote uh, my uh, Ravens in Winter, I think I ended up with seven or eight different hypotheses. I thought one of them might be maybe they're calling in a predator to to open the carcass because a, a raven uh, can't even peck through the skin of a gray squirrel. Uh, but, uh, you know, actually it's, it's quite a job for a raven to eat a gray squirrel. Uh, what they do is they start at the mouth and they pull things out and they can turn the skin inside out, but they can't penetrate the skin. But they can never penetrate into a deer. You know, they, they couldn't get anything until a coyote or a wolf or something tears into it. So it makes sense that if you find a carcass, you know, you're going to make a racket and, the, and, and some animal that, that uh, might recognize uh, uh, that call, uh, you know, that's associated with food would come and, and eat it. Uh, so that's your final, I mean, it's been many years since you, you written that. Is, that. is that your final uh, no. word on that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I had a hypothesis, but uh, I, 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 I'm not going to go into it. You're going to have to read the book. <laughs> I ended up with eight hypotheses. I think it was seven. Uh, but, uh, you know, I don't want to spoil it for you. Any of you who want to read it. Yes? So were the tree swallow uh, were the feathers that they used from tree swallows or from some other bird? No, uh, no, the swallows have only tiny little yeah. feathers. Yeah, so these are mostly <clears throat> turned out to be from waterfowl, uh -huh. uh, light colored feathers from waterfowl, uh, but they'll take, take any white feathers, chicken feathers. Yeah. I know out at North Branch Nature Center there's a box with tree swallows in it, and there was white fur in there that came from a llama uh, uh -huh. that was about a mile away. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know. Uh, I mean, uh, these that's the point, that, that these feathers uh, must come from long distances, especially where I was looking at in the, in the clearing in the woods. Uh, there's no waterfowl right there. They have to go at least a mile, yeah. uh, you know, and they come back with a feather, and they put about 50 of them in there, or up to 100. Uh, so it's a lot of work. So if you put in that much work, uh, you know, that would not be produced by natural selection unless there's some big advantage for it. And, uh, so that's, it's, that's generally what that species will do. So the evolutionary, the advantage to them is sufficient. And, and, and it must be clear when the range to go get the, that particular kind of feather is just too great an energy expenditure. Right. Right, so it, it, it's, it's a big energy expenditure. And the interesting thing is that it's mostly the male that brings the feathers. Usually, it, usually the male starts the nest and then the female lines it. Here it's, here, here, um, it's, it's the male that, that brings the lining. But she lines it, but he brings them. So, so there's something interesting story going on there. Why, why? <laughs> Again, uh, I, I, I haven't. I, I'm Spot parasites. Great idea. Why would they have to be white? See them better? Huh? See your uh, See bugs them? crawling around better? Yeah, well, <laughs> they don't generally pick out bugs. Yeah, that's, so that's one hypothesis. Okay, add that, <laughs> add that and, 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 and test it. <laughs> I have a few others too. So, <laughs> name, name one. 
Well, let's see. Uh, for one, you know, feathers are very hard to find, so it's, it's really something valuable, and the male brings them, so maybe it's like the bow bringing the bride, you know, pretty flowers, but he got, you know, it's very expensive, you know, it's really worth something, you know, you're bringing these flowers, so that's another hypothesis. I've got some more. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, I know there's, I don't remember what bird species, but uh, in one of the drumsticks, there's like southern areas, um, there was a bird that collects blue feathers and brings them in. So. Oh yeah, well, like the, like the uh, uh, <coughs> bird of paradise. I mean the, yeah, the, they, uh, they uh, uh, that uh, dec decorates a bower. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I don't know if anybody's figured that one out. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's something similar. It's definitely something uh, valuable. Yeah. Uh, it's attention getting, uh, but I don't think that is going to be the answer in this one. What color are their eggs? White. <laughs> so there you get a hit. There you go. Another hypothesis. Another hypothesis. <laughs> Another <laughs> hypothesis. Do, do ravens adorn their death nests with anything? Uh, no. I watched a raven collect a, it was a shiny ribbon. It was twirled around a, a street sign, uh -huh. and it picked up the end, and it figured out how to unravel it. And I, I wondered, what was it going to do with that shiny, shiny piece of ribbon? Well, I mean, they they do collect, you know, uh, ribbons of let's say ash bark, uh, the inner bark, you know, that's nested on fur. It could be, uh, it could be just uh, for the lining soft material. I don't, I have not seen uh, anything colorful or anything like that in, in the nest, but if it happens to be there, I think they'll just pick up anything that's kind of loose uh, for the lining and the outside, of course, it sticks. Yes? This might not be within the kind of work that you've done, but I'm curious about, um, I grew up in Scotland and there were magpies all over the place there and in uh -huh. Western Europe generally. Uh -huh. And there are magpies in the American West, but uh -huh. there aren't magpies in the East. Yeah. What's up with that? Good <laughs> question. Know? I have, I, I've wondered about that. I don't know. It's, it's, it's weird. Yeah. Seems and they're, like, a, they're a carrion species like um, yeah, uh, crows and ravens, right? Yeah, they, they are also carrion feeders, uh, more, a little bit like ravens uh, and crows, which are related. Uh, but, uh, you know, just like, uh, uh, yeah, these distributions are, are really kind of interesting. I mean, uh, about 20 miles away from where I live in Maine, there are gray jays, uh, and, you know, 20 miles further, there are none. Never seen one. So I don't know. In the other place, we see a lot of them. So, of course, habitat has to be uh, <coughs> appropriate, but it looks like the habitat is very similar. Uh, uh, so maybe it's competitors, uh, uh, a competing species, uh, might raid the nests. Uh, in a partic particular habitat. Uh, of course, birds <clears throat> tend to come back to their home area, but the, you know the, the same uh, pairs and the offspring, but that wouldn't explain that, that it would spread in some cases. So yes. blue jays are corvids like ravens, and have you done any work on with blue jays? Uh, no, I have not. Okay. I, I would like to, but I haven't done it. <laughs> In fact, I, I wanted to, uh, to do some of the <coughs> string pulling tests uh, with blue jays that I did with, with ravens uh, uh, last year, actually, and I got a permit for it to get the blue jays. And 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 I hunted all over, and I couldn't find a nest. So, <laughs> you know, there were about twenty of them around the feeders all the time. And but when it came time for finding a nest, they were all gone. <laughs> yeah, it'd be interesting to see the correlation. Yeah, it would be interesting to see, and I'd like to do it. 
but I did try with uh, with crows, and they and they couldn't do the same test mm -hmm. uh, that that the ravens passed. The crows couldn't do them. So, if I remember correctly, because I heard you talk about ravens a number of years ago, you had raised these ravens in an aviary where they could not have had a learning experience right. previously. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it was yeah. interesting how quickly they. Yeah. Yeah. Figured that out. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I was so you'd have had to do the same thing with, and how many, like how many birds do you need to have it be? I know, I know you're not trying for statistical. Yeah, yeah. Right? Well, I had, I think, five or six. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. What has been your favorite thing to study so far? Excuse me. What has been your favorite thing to study? So far? The favorite thing to study. Uh, the one that I'm at right now, which is, which is tree swallows. <laughs> we have time if you want to read a, a short passage from the new book. Uh, read a passage. <laughs> any uh, any suggestion? Uh, maybe. Okay. How about how about at the very end? It's just a very short one. It's actually uh, <clears throat> from field notes. Uh, uh, which is a publication of the Field Naturalists of Ecolog Ecological Planning uh, graduate program at the University of Vermont in 2017. And they asked me you know, to contribute once in a while. So um, I don't remember what they asked me to, to write about, but, uh, but this is what I wrote. Um, February 2017. <clears throat> At dawn, a chickadee sings, a downy woodpecker drums, and the red eastern horizon turns yellow. The Beatles put it this way, here comes the sun. It's been <clears throat> a long, cold, lonely winter. During the past months, there has been little light. Scars scarcity can be a good thing because it can draw attention to what we may take for granted. Scarcity forces us to fix it on what we miss. Right now, I really notice and appreciate the light. Most mornings throughout the winter, I have gotten up in the dark, anxiously awaiting the glow on the horizon. In the meantime, <clears throat> I had to make do with the faint fl flickering of rays from the wood stove onto the cabin floor. Light is a band of the electromagnetic spectrum, and only part of it is visible to us. We can't see the ultraviolet nor the wood stove's heat. But they can, but they are still there in real time. The light from the stove comes from sunlight stored the year before. The light I used while reading last evening had been captured the previous day by the seven by seven centimeter photovoltaic wafer on a twenty dollar inflatable Lucy light, a marvel of technology that catches and releases light by the push of a little button. This lamp's light supply captured the previous afternoon first traveled eight minutes and 20 seconds through space from the sun, where it was produced by the collision of hydrogen atoms to create helium by nuclear fusion. The marvel of what a Lucy light does is performed routinely by the trees all around me. They store energy of sunlight in molecular bonds in their wood and hold it until they die and decay or until I release it through combustion in our stove. But this light is captured by the chlorophyll molecule, the biolight catcher, and the reaction that grabs carbon dioxide molecules out of the air while also releasing oxygen. Photosynthesis stores the energy of the sun's atomic fusion in the molecular fusion of the tree's wood. Wood is an adaptation of the most amazing plants on Earth, a scaffolding that hoists solar-catching leaves high into the air. Each tree races for sunlight against others doing the same thing. The piece of maple burning in the stove next to me came from a tree I culled over a year ago, enabling many others near it to grow. It was made from light and carbon dioxide captured, captured decades earlier. 
stored sunlight in the form of wood makes life possible here in our off-the-grid cabin in the winter. <laughs> Meanwhile, tanker trucks drive daily up and down the road nearby, delivering cargoes of hydrocarbons from stored sunlight energy that was captured by chlorophyll long before maple trees even existed. We now mine that light and energy from the ground and are suddenly and apparently irretrievably committed to putting back into the atmosphere what took hundreds of millions of years to sequester underground. The oldest fossils on Earth are those photosynthetic organisms. The magic process made possible by chlorophyll put oxygen into our atmosphere and enabled the evolution of aerobic life. Oxygen now comes to us mainly via plants. The forest plants are the major atmospheric keepers. Forests also create soil, and by way of their root networks, they capture and store water that would otherwise not stay on the land. They create atmosphere, climate, and habitats, the home and food for millions of species. It is no wonder that we may reflexly balk at the idea of cutting trees up to burn cutting trees up to burn them, and perhaps we should. However, at the same time, considering the rest of the forest is just considering the rest of the forest is just as crucial. Trees are the most visible, but they are only one component of a forest. Obviously, we need more trees and clear cutting and plantations of vast tracts of land are poor substitutes for the ecological complexity of forests, but leaving them all untouched isn't the answer either. We keep and grow forests because they have a direct and clearly perceived value. I'm passionate about trees, and not only because they are light incarnate, I also like paper, pears, apples, and oranges, hazelnuts, timber frames, and wooden boats. I care about forests too, for their trees, for their trees, and for all that lives in, on, and around them. Growing a forest means harvesting trees by leaving trees, including the biggest of the best in the rare as well as the common, and allowing them to stay in a place for their entire lifespans. The problem is not that we exploit trees. The problem is not use but misuse by destroying forests and replacing them with trees only. But if misuse were reason to categorically abstain by credo, then one might as well prohibit having animals as companions or having children. <laughs> there is necessarily a cost to everything. It is a balance that counts, not just the ballast. Maybe that's seeing the light. <laughs> <laughs>